a few more questions and then we'll get to we'll shift gears. Or comment. It might tell us a little bit, but you know, I was talking to you before it even started today about the God that that's not real and the God that is real, the lover of my soul. How do I get this God out and this God in, basically? Well, the how, new, do you get out day to day? how do I go on and get rid of that old God? And that's the New Testament word for that is repentance. <coughs> repentance means to a radical change of the way you see things, a radical change of mind, um, a radical way. Be you transformed by the renewal of your mind. So, the way it works in practice is that you see something here that is beautiful and good, and you're scared. You don't know how to go against the system or how to think otherwise. But you just take a little baby step and you say, thank you, Holy Spirit, I'll have more, please. And you just keep taking these little baby steps of trust that this is true. That if it's true, then I'm not going to spend my day worried all day. Today I'm, I'm going to say, Lord, you love me and you have me. I can be free today, so I won't take a step in that. And you keep doing that just as an actual relationship. And before long, you're doing, you know, you're almost running or you may be riding your bicycle. And people over here looking at you maybe like you lost your mind. And people over here like you have got so much faith. And for you, it's not faith. It's like I'm just taking little baby steps. I'm, I'm Because each time you take a baby step, that releases the Holy Spirit's freedom and uh, power and joy in your life. And so it just keeps getting, that's the, that's the immeasurable part. But there's a whole other layer to this question and I want to deal with that, and I think we should deal with it now before we come back after lunch in the graveyard hour. <laughs> so, and I'm going to ask for you to be, um, some of you, um, I, want, I want to go inside a little bit of our own soul and brokenness, and this may be a little bit scary for some of you, and that's cool, it's scary for me too, but there's no harm meant. What we're talking about is really how do we get rid of this thing? And in trying to dissect how do we get rid of this thing, we've got to understand where it's lodged in us and how it got in there. So I want to dig around a little bit in what I called uh, the, our soul. And how do you share it? And, you know, and how do you share it? You've got this, uh, since Jesus lives in us, you've got this passion to spread it. Spread it. How do you do that? that? I appreciate the question, but on one level, to me, that's not, the, the question is, is not so much how do you do it. Is when you see something, and you you not even you don't even know you know how to paint, mm -hmm. and then you become an artist, mm -hmm. and you become this, you become that because it has to get out. So it is already being shared in and through you, and you'll begin to see how that's happening. And as you do, you can become more proficient at it. Some people will be teachers. Uh, some people uh, bake bread. Some people are. Uh, parents and I mean, there's lots of ways that it's already there and I'll deal with that later on this afternoon but um, for me the Christian life is is 99.9% .9 removal of our confusion <laughs> it's not about adding anything else you're already mothers and fathers and husbands and wives and friends and neighbors you're already concerned with things in it you're already participating in a Trinitarian life. The issue is not do we, what do we add. The issue is how do we take the blinders off so that we can really be much more proficient at what we're already doing. Motherhood, I was telling at breakfast this morning. I mean, you think about this. How many mothers in? Think about this. Through your body has come into being a human being that has never existed before in the history of the cosmos. And will never exist in, uh, again. It's unique. And through your being, once that baby's born in and through Jesus, that child will never go away. And in 10 trillion millennia, you're going to still be saying, I did that. I got to be part of that baby's creation. The Father, Son, and Spirit didn't need me, but that's what I got to be a part of. And there's incredible dignity in participating there. But we can't see that because we're trapped in this model and things like motherhood and fatherhood. Well, that's all fine. We've got to do something for God. And can't see what God's doing through us. It's, just, it's really sad. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm telling you, we're going to be embarrassed. and we're just, This family embarrassment, we're just going to go, Lord Jesus, I just, how can I have been so stupid and blind and live my life? I mean, motherhood 
Look at the way it's treated in our culture. And we're supposed to be a Christian country in some sort of way, but we denigrate it. We denigrate people who are stay-at-home moms because what's being a stay-at-home mom? I mean, all you're doing is training someone who will be here forever. How important is that? <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. What, I mean, think about it. I mean, think about it. Jesus is saying that this child has come into being through you, and I'm entrusting this child's future to you. Now, get, put your big girl britches on and walk with me in this. And the rest of you men begin to relate to your wives and husbands for what they really are and what they're involved in. That's just, it's like so simple to me, but it's so huge. And we live in a culture that won't even allow us to begin to do it. It seems so stupid just to, you know, to, oh man. But how embarrassing is it going to be when, when we step across Jordan and we see Jesus for who he is and we see everybody else for who he is and then we begin to see the way we thought of them because all they were were mothers. I mean, what is a doctor compared to a mother in that sense? What is a teacher? I mean, this is, you know, doctors and mothers I mean, and teachers help the children along the way, but they don't bring them here. This is this beautiful dignity that's given to mothers all over the world, whether they know what's going on or not, and whether we know what's going on or not. And the day will come when we begin to relate to mothers. And what's going to happen? You want to talk about what we do, what we can do? Start treating mothers with the dignity that they deserve because of who they are. You do that one thing, and I guarantee you, churches will grow. Just start relating to them with the dignity. Don't make it fake and all that. There is beautiful, profound dignity in being a mother. In and through you, this child, these children have come into being. And that deserves, uh, that deserves to be recognized. That deserves to be appreciated. It deserves to be honored. If you treat people that way, they respond to that. When you begin to see inside of people... Um, the passion, for example, a good quick illustration. I was up in Winnipeg teaching, and we had a break, and it was right on the Winnipeg River, and I was I just could not stay inside. I just drawn out. So I walked out there, and there's a guy by his boat, and he was getting ready to fish, and we started talking about fishing. And so we just, this long conversation was going on. He was all fired up about it, and, and uh, he, he said, well, how long, you know, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Mississippi. And he said, well, how long are you going to be here? And I said, I'm leaving tomorrow. And he said, he said, well, why don't you stay another day and I'll take you out fishing tomorrow. We'll fish all day if you got time. And I, I was like, oh, man. You know? And, and uh, anyway, I was telling the guys later about the story. I said, you know, you see what happens. You meet a person in their passion, which I know doesn't originate with them because Jesus is a really great fisherman. And one of the last things he did before he was uh, ascended was to instruct the disciples as to where to cast after he had all, already caught fish, cleaned them, and prepared breakfast for them. I mean, this is, so I know what's going on. This guy just loves fishing. And, and it were, I sort of stepped in his passion with him and honored it and related to him in it. And then I got invited to be part of his day the next day. I wasn't trying. It just, it happens. Because you see, it's, it's not that Jesus is absent. And now we've got to figure out how to get him in our lives. He's already here. He's already at work. It's already happening. We just begin to learn to see it for what it is. And you relate to people and honor them in it. They don't resist. They don't throw up crosses. They, you know, you're not trying to get them to come over here and jump through these stupid hoops that we don't even like, that we have to jump through because we're part of this, this religious system and nobody believes in it, but this is what we're told. And we go out there and we try to get people to come, come join us and jump through our lifeless hoops. And so we can, I mean, it's no, it's way bigger than that. Jesus is already here. He's already sharing himself and his life with all of us. That's what motherhood is. That's the core of passion and creation and creativity and music. <laughs> I mean, we invent this thing called Christian music. Well, I want to know where harmony comes from. Now, where does harmony come from? Is that not a Trinitarian idea? Doesn't that come right out of the relationship with the Father, Son, and Spirit? So we go over here and we create this thing called Christian music. And it's got to be better than regular music because there's no Jesus, there's no Father, Son, and Spirit in regular music. Although all of us will pay big dollars to hear some of these people sing, will we not? And stand up and clap and do stuff that we don't even feel comfortable doing. Mm. <laughs> So you got this thing called Christian music, and we're all supposed to listen to it, but it bores most of us to death. 
I mean, to just be honest. I mean, that, and I'm not writing all Christian music off. I've got a lot of good friends. I've got a lot of good friends that are Christians who are musicians, but they don't want to be labeled here because they've got to they got to be, they got to do it a certain way, you got to sign a certain way, and it seems always to be, um, well, I, I don't listen to it. I, want, I listen to the harmony of the Trinity. That's what I love, and I see it everywhere. I'm learning to see it in lots of places. I'm learning to listen to it in music. That's what's so beautiful about Beethoven, if you like classical music. That's what's beautiful about a jazz ensemble. That's the harmony of the Father, Son, and Spirit coming right to expression. I don't care who sees it. And here's the beautiful thing. They don't care. They're not all worried that they're not going to get credit. They love to see us ride on our bike. They love to see us play music. It's beautiful. When you begin to relate to people, that it creates community. I mean, you begin to honor someone for the way that they're able to play, and you just say, then that was beautiful. I was glad to be here. That creates relationship. You end up in a conversation, and before long, you've invited them over for a drink or for supper, or they've invited you to the next concert, and it's, this becomes a community around what's already happening. Nobody's doing anything. Nobody's trying to say, how can I do this in a Christian way? And anyway, the Lord, the Lord deliver us from anything disharmonious that gets labeled with the name of Jesus Christ. Think about that. Anything disharmonious that gets labeled with the name of Jesus and has all these Bible verses attached to it. And then you kind of defend this disharmonious, destructive thing and you're trying to call it Jesus and you're trying to quote Bible verses to defend it and everybody in the room knows it's dead and knows it stinks but we got no option but we do have an option. We do have an option. The option is to go back to Jesus and let him lead us to know his Father and let him lead us to know the Holy Spirit and meet, And we can, then can live. And then you see it everywhere. On the baseball field, you see it at work. You see it in people who are broken and damaged and just almost on the edge of the abyss. I mean, how cool is it when you can talk to someone who is, who is suicidal and you're trying to help them see who's really inside of them? Because you know if they can meet Jesus Christ in this darkness right now, they're coming out. And I'm not trying to convince them intellectually, or I'm not trying to quote Bible verses. I'm trying to help them encounter someone who's already in them. And once they see it, then they have a new reason to be, a new definition of themselves, a new hope that I can, my life can be different. I'm not alone. It's not just up to me. There's somebody in me that's got life. So, I mean, so... It seems to me that we, we're putting on a new pair of glasses where we can see people for what's really going on. And as we relate to them in that, as you refuse to believe that this person, let's say the suicide, uh, the person who's trying, as you refuse to accept the way they see themselves, that is not who you are. I see who you are. I see beauty here. I see goodness here. Let me show you. You remember when you said this. You remember when you did this. You start appealing to them. They know. And all of a sudden you're giving, I'm not adding anything to their life. It's about recognizing it. And that's back to the word you quoted yesterday. That's where the, the, the idea of recognition, uh, recognizance, re-knowing, seeing it is really important. Um, anybody else want to follow up, comment on that? I, I, one year in Australia, this, they passed, I could see some of the folks passing around this note or whatever. It finally got to me and it was a cartoon. And this, this uh, students were there. This one kid had his hand raised and he had his, and they says, Mr. Kruger, would you please stop? My, my mind is hurting. <laughs> so, all right. Um, let's, let's go in, a, in a, a different direction. And I want you to see this because th there's some real freedom that begins to happen when we can see this dimension of this two gods thing that's happened within us. Let me begin by asking uh, a question. Uh, how many of you have ever heard the whisper, I am not? Raise your hand. Some of you raised two hands, right? <laughs> uh, I am not what? How about I am not special? I am not, I am not what? Not wanted, not welcomed, not loved. Love, not good enough, not valuable. I 
told you we're going to need a bigger whiteboard. And I've got two offices back home. One's where my private study is, and I've got a desk and a little conference room. With, and another one's upstairs where I've got a, <laughs> the whole wall is, is two or three four by eight sheets of stuff. I went about to Home Depot and bought it and plastered it up there. <laughs> and we just start over there and just kind of go this way. And there's never enough room. Um, anyway, I am not special. I'm not wanted. I'm not welcomed. I'm not loved. I'm not good enough. I'm not valuable. I'm not important. What else? Worthy. I didn't get that. What was that? Worthy. 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 Not worthy. What else? Come on, folks. Not perfect. <laughs> Not smart enough. And beautiful. Here's here's my, one of my my big ones. I'm not there yet. I'm not normal. <laughs> Haven't arrived. Now, we can go in three directions with this. One question on the table is where does this come from? And the second question on the table is how does this get inside of our souls and when it gets inside of our souls what does it produce so in a minute I want to come back and talk a little bit about let me give you one illustration I know you have your own stories some of you may have really wrestled with this and have seen lots of stuff and found some real healing some of you may be scared to death to even look at this um, but let me give you a story a friend of mine out west, out this way in the country, and I were talking one night, and he says to me, he says, Baxter, when I was five years old, my dad was plowing in the field out behind our house and with a mule and um, a plow. And he whistled to my mother and did like this, which she said means bring him some tape so he can cover the blisters that are on his hands. So he said... I ran and got the tape, and he said I was going to I was going to be a part. And so he said I ran out to the field and I tore off a piece of tape about six or seven inches long, and by the time I got there, it had all stuck to itself and it was just a gnarled mess. And he said when I got there, he said my dad looked at me with utter disgust in his eyes, and he snatched the tape from me and he said he put his hand on my head, spun me around and kicked me and knocked me on the ground. And he said, I peed in my pants and I cried all the way home. And he sat there that night with me with his hands shaking and he said, 50 some odd years later, it still makes a knot well up in my gut. Now you see, I am not is not just something that we invent. I am not comes with associations with historical things that happened to us in our lives. How does a five-year-old boy ever begin to get to the place to where he can even begin to be interested or believe in the goodness of Jesus' Father when this was his earthly dad? You have stories of your own, some way worse. Some, some folk, I mean, everywhere I go, I mean, this is, these things are burned into us. I told you the story about my, my grandmother. You know, bless his heart, he's just dumb. I mean, my grandmother never said that to me when I was growing up. I never heard that. But I got the message. That my brothers were the smart ones. I was the mechanic. I could fix anything. So I thought that's what I would probably do. So I never really gave college a very good shot because I just didn't believe I could do it. And I eventually ended up in seminary and started making like a full point in Greek and Hebrew. And my mother and dad were like, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> uh, you know, bless his heart. Now, my mother does not. She's in a, a different. Uh, she says, you know, I, I told you last night. Uh, she says this has been a part of my whole makeup forever and ever and ever that she can remember. But anyway, you get a, you get messages that come to you 
Uh, it may be through a divorce. It may be through husband or wife or father or mother. It may be through the church. I mean, the message that I heard my whole life was that you were totally depraved. The whole human race is totally depraved. And if that doesn't mean I'm not good, not good enough, not worthy, not there yet, not, you know, all of that's just burned in and it goes right inside of our souls. It enters right here. And you know how it gets in there? It gets there through faith. <laughs> we believe it. My friend tells a story about when he was 12 years old, his, um, oh, he, he, wasn't, he, he was younger than that. His uncle gave him a dog, a border collie, for his birthday. It was the greatest ple- present he ever had. He named his dog Charlie. It's in my book, the Across All Worlds, that story. And he named his dog Charlie, and he said, man, and it was instantly bonding. Everywhere I went, Charlie went with me. If we're riding bikes, we're swimming in the creek, if we're just sitting on the back porch. I, everywhere I went, Charlie went with me except Sunday morning church because we knew Charlie couldn't go to church with us. And he said, every night I would go to sleep and reach down, and I would find comfort rubbing Charlie's head and ears. And, and we were riding in his truck when he was telling me this story. And he said, he said Baxter, he said, uh, somewhere around my 12th birthday, um, Char- uh, Charlie died. And I didn't ask him what happened. Here's a grown man crying, telling me this story. Charlie died, and he said, and I went back, and I buried him in my backyard. I dug a hole, buried him, and I found an old boat paddle that was split and some rope from a tire swing, and I tied a cross, and I put the cross there. And he said, I went back, and I stood on my back porch. He said, my mom and dad and friends and my brothers and sisters, I don't know. He said, there were a bunch of people in the house. And he said, I stood on that back porch, and I cried my eyes out all afternoon. And not one person came out to comfort me. No one noticed. No one came out and said, well, we'll get you a new dog. No one came out and said, well, in the book of Revelation, there are horses in heaven. Maybe, maybe Charlie will be in heaven when you get there. No comfort, no anything. He said, I realized that day that I do not matter. I am not important. You with me? Now, how hard is it is it for us to see that man spend the next 50 years of his life proving by God I am important? And I will prove to the world that I am important. Maybe be an athlete, maybe a businessman, maybe whatever, but I am going to pick a prize that will prove to the world that I'm important, and I will leave a trail of wreckage behind me because none of this is important, wife, children, all this stuff. You know, what's important is I get to that prize and the sad thing is you finally get to it and it doesn't make you important, but you don't know that. And this, I mean, we're talking about the way life gets shaped in us and we start living it out in our darkness. It may be that I can be porn, important if I can get inside that system and get me one of those pointed hats. And, and, and if I finally get inside that system and get me one of those pointed hats, you better not come telling me this is not real or I'll kill you. That's what they did to Jesus. You know, this is, this is all we got. This is our whole sense. And we're responding to an I am not. And then we go to church. And I'm being a little facetious here. But we go to church and the pastor says, well, you need to read more and study more and pray harder. So we read more and study more and pray harder. But it doesn't even touch this. This is a booger bear. In fact, uh, if we don't learn how to deal with this, we really don't have anything to say. Except we'll go to a place called heaven when you die. But this we believe, and we believe because of things that actually happen to us. And the evil one is sitting there, crouched like a roaring lion. And when my friend said, when he he heard the whisper, I am not important, and I'm not worthy, and I'm not valuable. And the evil one was right there saying, that's right. That's right. But I can show you how to be valuable. I mean, we're sitting ducks. We we don't even know this is going on. We're not wise enough yet to experience enough to even know this is happening. And some of us, some of us who are smitten and afflicted with I am not, we look to another person. What um, is called our magical other. I'm trying to think of the guy's name that wrote the book, the, the, the Eden Project, The Search for Our Magical Other. What we do, we all do this, is that we turn to another person that will make us worthy and make us complete and make us whole and make us alive. And we fall in love. 
and we're now in a relationship where we're desperately hoping that this person is going to be able to give us something that we don't have in ourselves. And we're putting pressure on that person, and that person's putting pressure on us in two, three, four. At first in that relationship is good because you really feel wanted and needed. But then you feel overwhelmed because whatever it is I'm supposed to put on the table for my partner, I cannot do. And whatever it is they're supposed to put on the table for me, they cannot do. And so what happens typically is you, you part and you go out and you reload and do the same thing again. Still searching for someone to answer a question inside of your soul that we don't even know is there. And now we may have two or three children in the mix. All kinds of, this is the way life gets, gets lived out is that we're afflicted with this I am not, which is ultimately, this is ultimately, whose, whose conclusion is that? It's not even our conclusion. It's Diabolos, the liar. Who, who, whose conclusion is I am? That would be Jesus. So what we're going to do is see how Jesus gets his I am inside our I am nots. That's what we're talking about here. But there's a little bit more to this that I want to, I want to go through. Um, another story. Um, Stephanie is a beautiful young girl in middle America. Um, her dad's a little odd. He's he's distant, a little bit aloof, but he's given her tries to give her everything that he's, he that he could possibly give to her, and she feels like she can never measure up. That her friends are always scrutinized. The way she dresses is never right. She can never get it right. He's always watching her. Uh, he's about as personal as a Pharisee. Um, he doesn't know how to affirm. Now I'm not talking about how he got that way and what the backstory is in his life, because you could take this right on back for three or four generations. I'm just, and Stephanie decides in her mind that I am not acceptable as I am. It's not good enough for me just to be me. I've got to do something to earn my father's acceptance and his affirmation. So she sets out to get straight A's, because she thinks, you know, he respects that sort of thing. I'll get straight A's, and then I'll be okay with my father. My father will be okay with me. And this is one of the reasons I think Jesus instructs us, do not call anyone on earth father. Don't get your earthly dad tangled up with my papa. That's when we hadn't done that. And one of the things that happens as a result of that is that most of us don't realize there's a huge difference between our earthly father, daddies, and Jesus' father. <laughs> See what I'm saying? I just think that if we'd have maintained Jesus, if we'd have gone with him and listened to him on that, we would overcome a lot of a lot of pain because we would know to be looking for our real father that our earthly father is a is a pale reflection of our real father but we've gotten so entangled in our minds you get hurt by your earthly dad you're not going to be looking to your heavenly father it takes a while that's a hard one if you get hurt by an elder in the church in the name of Jesus you don't want anything to do with Jesus that Jesus this Jesus you don't know about yet but he knows about you. Okay, so Stephanie decides she's going to go for make great straight A's, and so she works all semester long, and the semester's over, and she's, she's standing at the window. She's 12 years old, standing at the window, biting her fingernails, waiting for the postman to come, and it's raining outside. And she just eventually gives up, and she turns to walk back when she hears brakes squeal out front, and she looks out the window, and it's the postman. And he's putting the, the, um, the post in, into um, the letters and stuff into the mailbox. And so she runs outside, and she opens it up, and her letter from the school is right on top as if the postman knew. And so she rips it open, and she gets all A's, and she goes running inside, and she knows the rule. It's Saturday morning. Daddy's reading the paper, having the coffee. Do not disturb Daddy. But she goes running in. She said, Daddy, Daddy, I got all A's. I got all A's. I did it. Nothing. Read the newspaper. She has worked now. And this is not just one semester. There's all the backstory as to why she feels like she's got to earn this. It's going on from the time she was a little girl, you see. 
And she's standing there at 12 years old, having really thrown her heart and soul in this. And she got all A's, and her daddy doesn't say a word. And she says one more time, Daddy, I got, I got all A's. And she turns to walk out of the room all those years crashing down on her proving for once and for all now that she's not acceptable and not good enough and that something's wrong with her and and over the paper comes the statement you should have mm. now in itself there's not anything wrong with that you should have well of course you got all these days you're a brilliant young girl your mother's been working. There's all kinds of things that could be read into that. But from where Stephanie is standing, she has worked and worked and worked, and she's tried to find her father's affirmation. And now that I am not to sit work within her has been slammed into the core of her soul. You see? And then you think, well, what? what my, let's call my friend with his dog Charlie. What, let's call him John. <laughs> what did Stephanie and John get married? <laughs> You see? And what if one day uh, John's sitting <laughs> Saturday morning reading the newspaper and Stephanie walks in and he doesn't drop the newspaper and look at her. And he hadn't done anything. He's just sitting there reading the newspaper. Maybe, maybe it's a Super Bowl report or something. He's all fascinated and, and in and of itself it's no big deal. But all this stuff starts going off in her. You know, it's all those wounds and all that just rattling at the garbage can all over again. He's like, what, what, what did I do? What did I do? And, and this whole thing gets twisted around like a tornado. And before long, it's just a mess. And it's all rooted in our faith, in our particular family of I am nots, and in the way those were burned into us. You with me? You see that? Now, how many times have you ever heard this conversation in church? You see, we, we, we're free to have this conversation because we know, all of us know, well, the I am not can't be the truth because we're caught up in Jesus, I am. So I want to live in his I am, so how do we, so then we begin to, to be free to look at some of this and face some of those things. And I know Stephanie, so that's not her real name. I know her. I, she told me the story with tears in her eyes. I've been able to walk with her and see her begin to realize, well, her dad's a broken man that he probably got the crap beat out of him by his dad, and he was doing a great job to get here to provide these things for her. And so there's some healing that's happened here, and, she's and they're both beginning to function from, well, maybe our two fathers really don't have the verdict for us, or maybe it's our mothers, or maybe, maybe it's the church and the gospel message that's hammered us again and again and again on how unworthy we are and we're not good enough, and maybe we got certain Bible verses underlined that prove this. I can tell you, until this is dealt with, until this is death dealt with, we don't really have healing. You see, I remember when my wife Beth and I were first married, this was been 20, we'll be married 29 years this month. Um, a patient woman. Anyway, when we first got married, we had, we had a little, um, um, let me think, where was I? What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. And we had a um, Saturday morning. I got up and I got my golf clubs and I said, I'm going to go play golf with my friend. And she said, well, I thought we were going out today. And I'd forgotten. And she said, don't worry about it. Go on and play golf. I, you know, so I said, okay. A young, a young married man's mistake. Um, and I said, okay. So I left and I'm driving down the road and I thought, this, this is not smart. Even the thick-headed young married, you know, in his 20s thought, this is not smart. So I turned the car around, came home, grabbed my clubs, walked inside, leaned on and said, Beth, I'm home. I decided I don't want to play golf. I want to spend the day with you. And she was standing there, and she turned around and looked at me, and she just burst out laughing. And I'm like, whoa, dude, what? Because, and that's when I learned that communication involves not two things, but three things. It involves your words and your actions, and it involves your soul. And what's going on in your soul fills your words and actions with invisible meaning that everybody's picking up on. 
because there's so much of the invisibles that's coming from our soul that gets attached to the words. And that's what, so she's sitting there reading my soul. And even though I did the right thing, action wise, behavior wise, I came back and I said the right thing. I love you and I want to spend the day with you. She knew that there was a lot more going on. And that, that was my wake up call to learn that there's more going on. This is why you can hear a sermon on Sunday morning that is exegetically quote unquote solid and it is delivered with rhetorical skill, but it is dead as hell. <laughs> because it's not a river of living water proceeding forth from the innermost being, but a river of toxic waste, a river of I am not. This is why you can hear someone play a piano and be dead on perfect, and yet it be dead. And this is why you can hear a young girl who's five years old trying to play and getting everything wrong, but it's full of life. Because it's I am coming out there, struggling to make, you see that? This, this is real liberating stuff when you begin to see it. You begin to see what's happening in people. We're locked in over here. You got to say it right. You got to do it right and look it right. And these people are saying it right, looking right. I, I would disagree with maybe saying it right, but they've got the part memorized and they look it. And there's no condemnation. There's no condemnation for any of us in that. I'm just helping us see this is what's going on with. This is why we know this is dead. I'm explaining to you why a conclusion that you already have reached. This is why the system hasn't worked is because it's not addressing the I am not. It's addressing outward behaviors and words. It's saying the right words the right way. But there's no river of living water flowing out here. And when the river of living water is flowing out and it accompanies right words and right actions, that creates a whole new life, very much like the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit. So by faith, based on our his historical circumstances in our life, we have reached the conclusion like Stephanie and John that we're not welcomed and we're not loved and we're not good enough and we're not there yet. And that produces um, fear and what else? Fear and anxiety, worry, worry. Perfectionism. perfectionism, ulcers. <laughs> <laughs> my friend, now you can tell who's been through therapy. <laughs> my friend said he was at. His wife's, it was a, it was a uh, part of Christmas party, and he said he was with his wife's uh, tennis club and a bunch of, um, of their husbands and friends or whatever, and, and all these people sitting around saying, I'm just so OCD, and I'm just so ADD, and he said, I'm just so ODD, and they all said, what's ODD, and he said, odd. <laughs> I, thought, I said, I'm going to tell that one. I'm going to tell that one. You, you've got. Now, because of what we believe about ourselves, and not just out of thin air, but it's whispered to us by evil and it's got historical precedent, we begin to believe that we're not smart enough, we're not beautiful enough, and we have fear and shame and anxiety, and that leads to perfectionism and man, obsession, uh, compulsion, all kinds of things, but we can't deal with this. And it leads to, like I said last night, it leads the the, grill, the real... Uh, killer here is it leads into self-centeredness because with this going on inside you cannot be focused on giving yourself for other people's benefit you are only trying to figure out how I can get rid of this so now I'm using my friends I'm using the church I'm using the Bible I'm using everything around me to try to deal with some of this that I don't even know is going on and I certainly don't have the courage to look at this. And if you go poking around in my life, I'm not letting anybody know this is happening. Because if you see this in me, then I'm toast with God, G-O-D. I got nowhere to stand. This is at the core of my being. So there's nothing good that I can bring to the table before. I mean, we're really. And so people say, well, believe in Jesus and you go to heaven when you die. Well, that's fine. You got a ticket to go to heaven when you die. But who's got this going on inside is going to walk through the pearly gates. I mean, for real. When you got this going on inside and you're anxious and worried and ashamed, why would you dare walk through the pearly gates and meet this God? This is the dynamic that I was talking about a little bit last night. But now let me show you one other part of this. And this is when, and then we can come back uh, afterwards and talk about this, but also we can um, take some time this afternoon and ex 
and expand this out because you can go that way, this way, different ways. But I want to show one more point. When, you know, give me, I often say at seminars, uh, give me one word summary of the nature of God. Who, who is God? Usually the first word that comes up is holy. And usually pretty quickly somewhere in there comes up unapproachable. And distant and judgmental or judge. And then there's love thrown in there. And then what else? Impersonal. Watcher. What else? Y'all help me. One word summary. Perfect. That's two words. Omniscient. All the omnis. All the omnis. Now what I want you to see is that part of the reason, not intellectually but psychologically, and psychology comes from the Greek word psyche, which is the Bible word, means soul. So we don't need to let the psychologist or psychological community borrow one of our ideas and words and hijack it and act like we're not allowed to talk about that. We are. But I'm talking about one of the reasons inside of our soul that we can't let this God go. And what I want you to see now is do you see a relationship between our I am nots and this vision of God? Now this is what Athanasius called mythology. The faceless, nameless G-O-D, faceless, nameless, holy, unapproachable, distant, judgmental, got some kind of love in there somewhere, but we all know that's not really the truth. He's watching us with his disapproving heart. He's perfect, all-knowing, all all the omnis, powerful, all of that. Athanasius calls this mythology because we are creating a myth out of our own darkness and projecting that. We're tarring Jesus' Father's face with the brush of our own angst. Right here, angst. You see that? You get that? Are you with me? This is really important. This is also, today, we would call this projection. I, uh, psychologically, psychological community calls that projection, where you're really projecting your own issues, and you're and you're tarring the Father's face with the brush of your own anxiety, and you create an unstable, watching God who's looking at you, who's judgmental at the core of His being, and then this, you get this, this then begins to prove and reinforce the I am not, and this becomes a triangulation. And it goes round and round that way, and it goes this way, and it goes all which ways. And then we've got historical proof for this because of things that have happened to us in our lives. And then we've got preachers that will stand up and preach from Bible texts that prove all this is true. And it's going round and round and round. And we've got nowhere to get off. How do you stop this thing? How do you begin to deal with this thing? Because you, And the only thing you can do religiously is buy into somebody's system and be perfect at it. Because then maybe you can prove to this God that you are good. And maybe you can prove to yourself that you, I, that you are I am not is, is a lie. And then it begins to work its way out in all kinds of ways in our lives. We begin to we begin to say to ourselves, I, I'm not special, but I can be. If I can get this job or this person or this relationship or this money or this position or this house or this place or I am not special, but I can be. If I can not only become a member of this group, but if I can move up within that group and become somebody and I'm going to buy into all of their kind of rules and regulations because I'm trying to get them to figure out a way to make me feel good about myself. This is the birth of religion, not Christianity, mind, and not gospel. This is the birth of religion. This is the birth of all of our subcult. This is the birth of Western marketing. <laughs> you know, if you know that everybody in the room feels I am not I am not worthy, I'm not important, then I can tell you how you can be. And you look at our marketing. It buys into the I am not, and it tells you, get this, and you got it. And just change out. Just change out what it is. And that's all it does. Again and again, it keeps changing out the billboard because you get that, and it doesn't work. We'll keep changing out and making money hand over fist, playing off of our deep pain as human beings. 
And so I am not special, but I can be if I work hard enough and if I get one of these things. Or I am not special. What do you mean I'm not special? Of course I'm special. Did you see the Braves play last night? How about them Cowboys? I mean, I, I ain't facing I'm not special. What do you mean? I'm just fine. You're fine. Everybody's fine. So I'm not about to look at any of this because I don't have an answer. So I'm just going to be out there in la-la land. And I'm just going to stay real busy and keep myself doing things that I'm supposed to do because I am never going to look at myself. Stephanie is never going to look inside of her soul and see how this happened. John's not going to do it until their marriage and relationship absolutely craters and they got nowhere to go. And the Holy Spirit's holding them together and they're saying, somebody please help me know what is going on in my life and I got this way. And then they're ready to begin to see some of this and see how this is going and where this comes from. Then it triangulates and it gets rolling. You got, you got what I call self-salvation. I am not special, worthy, important, love, but I can make myself special, important, worthy, love, and I'm going to go for this. And that's all about personality. And, and what, you know, I'm not, um, uh, I was not gifted enough to be a world-class sports person, so I didn't, I didn't dream of making myself special that way. But I do have a Ph.D. in theology from one of the best universities in the world. <laughs> I was shot out of my mother's womb as a young man in, in a family of educated people, my I am not was right here. I am not there yet. And there's a high bar in my family because my great-grandfather was not only a doctor, he was the county doctor. And he had the first car in the county. And do you know what his phone number was? I've seen a prescription. His phone number was one. I grew up in his house. You telling me I'm not there yet? That's a, that bar is high. That bar is real high. And you got to achieve pretty significant place before you can even compete in that circle. I didn't know. I mean, this. so this has been my big one. And the Achilles heel of I'm not there yet is you don't get to enjoy the journey. I had a friend of mine say to me the other day, he said, Baxter, one of the things I like, I've learned about you, is he says, you really enjoy the process. He says, the process is fun with you. And I, I took that as the greatest compliment. It just blessed me because he didn't know any, he, didn't, he wasn't talking about this. But he was saying is when I'm with you and we're trying to do something, we, you make sure that we enjoy getting there as much as having arrived. And it's taken me years. But typically people like me that are not there yet but buy into some way of doing it, you're running roughshod over your family and your daughters and your, your wife and your friends you're, you're there with them, but you're not there. You're preoccupied with something else. And that, that's this I thought. You don't even notice that your daughter's crying. You don't notice this is going on in your wife's heart. You're not there for them. And so this just destroys relationships if you're not careful. In your attempt to get someplace that once you get there doesn't work anyway, but you don't know it. You know, so I'm not there yet. Now here's the other side of that that I love. This is when you've been... To, um, this is when I began to clue in on um, the way Papa and Jesus and the Holy Spirit love us personally and enjoy us in our I am notness and in our brokenness. I read a, a part of a book called Genius, Grace, and Grief, uh, written by a psychiatrist, and it was uh, I'm, best I can remember. It wasn't particularly well written, but the thesis of the man was really a great thesis. He went back through church history and identified several great leaders in church history, like Martin Luther. And the first thing he did was diagnose their psychosis and their, and their pathology. And then he began to show how that people like Luther could not have been Luther and done what Luther did was he not screwed up. You with me? Now, here's, here's an illustration. J.B. Phillips, who wrote the J.B. Phillips translation, you know that? J.B. Phillips was obsessive compulsive, and what did he do? He did a word study on every single Greek New Testament word. Every one of them. And, then he, and the Lord says, we can take that. That's cool with us. You're obsessive. I can show you how we can work our grace into your obsession. And so I'm sitting there, and some one day it hit me. I thought, here's this man named Baxter, middle son, not there yet, comes from a family of classic overachievers, his older brother's in law school, and ah, 
He's obsessive. He's got a good mind. He grew up in the country, so he knows how to communicate with people. Oh, let's let him obsess on the Trinity for 25 years. So I, I, you begin to see how the Lord not only knows about our brokenness, but uses it and is in the middle of it with us, all the while bringing healing at the same time and using your journey, which is not there yet, to help all kinds of other people get on the journey with you. You see it? All the while, if we're not careful, we're over here condemning ourselves because we're not there yet and we got to get it right. And we just and you hear people praying, oh man, this one I was I was teaching some young people one time, and I was on my way to teach at this place and I was walking through these rooms, it's kind of a corridor, and I heard one group of people praying in the in the room, and I mean they were praying, Oh God, you've got to just come down and you got I'm like, I was like, Whoa, 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 whoa. I said, I just want to go. Incarnation. <laughs> no. God, you're high and lifted up and you dwell. You know, unapproachable. Incarnation. He's come to be with us. He's here. He's here. You can, you can turn that down a little bit. <laughs> We're going to be embarrassed. I grew up in a church that has a bulletin. It has every Sunday morning, the first thing you do is you have the invocation. You know what the invocation is? You invoke the presence and blessing of God on the service. I was sitting there one day and I thought, ooh, 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 we are going to be embarrassed. Because the invocation assumes that we, in our own strength and wisdom and goodness, decided that we were going to get up that morning and we were going to go to church and we were going to worship God and now we want God to bless us. Let me tell you, if Jesus wasn't in you, you would not get out of bed. You would have no notion of honoring God with any sense of worship. And the whole thing we're participating, we're being moved by the Father, Son, and Spirit, and we get there thinking we've done it, and now we're going to do this, and we're going to ask God to bless it. And I think the angels are like, whoa, dudes, what are you doing? <laughs> do you not understand? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Do you not understand? I'm already here. I got this. I'm in the middle of this. We're doing this. This is going to be good. Relax and enjoy my presence. This striving, this, this. So for me, one of the breakthroughs in my life was to begin to realize, and this is where it, one of the places where it happened to me. It's one of my stories. I tell you, uh, I was in um, Scotland studying, working on my doctorate, and um, which never really was a doctorate to me. It was an opportunity to really delve into this and see it and to be with J.B. Torrance and get to hear him and teach it. Anyway, I was sitting in my study and I was reading Galatians in that passage where it says, Abba, Father, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are children crying, Abba, Father. This is one of the, the key passages in Romans and in Galatians, crying, Abba, Father. You see, that's the Holy Spirit's cry. Now, Jesus is the only one that ever addressed God as Abba, Father. And the Holy Spirit's crying that in Jesus. So that's part of that, that connecting, that overcoming the gap, that, that go-between. Uh, I meant to say that a while ago. Uh, there's no charge for that, by the way. <laughs> that's a freebie. <laughs> but this next bit, you're going to get charged for. Uh, um, I was sitting there reading that passage, and I kept thinking, Abba, Father. I mean, that just sounds so noble to me and so beautiful. And I prayed. I said, Lord, I know I'm not there yet. And one day I want to be there. I want to experience what you're saying here. Paul, what were you talking about? Jesus, would you help me experience this Abba Father thing? I'm thinking it's way up there. And I'm one day, may, if I work hard enough and if I'm good enough, and if I keep getting it right, one day I may achieve an experience like that. And I'm serious, and I'm praying that way. And I was serious and earnest in my heart. And, and it was literally like I began to have a conversation with Jesus. Or he began to have a conversation with me. And it went something like this. Hey, Baxter, where are you? I'm in Scotland. Well, what are you doing in Scotland? I'm studying and working on uh, my doctorate. What's your topic? Knowing God. <laughs> uh, so did you just one day decide that you were going up and be passionate about knowing my father? Did you just decide one day you were going to sell everything you have and drag your wife and 
over here because you wanted to dedicate your life to understanding my father? And I'm like, not really. Well, could Abba Father have been working in you for a little while now here before you knew about it? <laughs> and maybe, maybe that was in you and I've been sharing my Abba Father relationship with you for a long time and that's really what you're doing here is you, you've come over here in that because you want to know more. You want to understand it more beautifully. I was sitting there, you're talking about embarrassed. I was like, oh man, because I thought I had done this. I thought it was me making my, my presentation or my gift to God. The whole time Jesus is saying, man, you, you would never get out of bed. If Jesus removed himself from us on this, on this, uh, in our lives, you know what we would do? i tell you what we would do. We would walk over in the corner and we would fall on our knees and we'd face it and be catatonic and we'd never get up. But life is scary. It's so scary. At any minute, everything we know could be destroyed and decimated. And it's just tough. All of us are sharing in Jesus' courage all the time. That's why we get out of bed. That's why we take a baby step. That's why the artist will first, in spite of I am not, the artist will try to paint something. That's why people like me will try to go and figure this out. That's why people, that's what we're in it. We participate. We can't see it. I am is already in us shouting over the I am not. And the question is, how did I am get in there? And I want to come back to that uh, later. But when you got this triangulation thing going, you can't really break out of that. This is all you know. And you hear, you hear a sermon or you hear somebody talk about this and you can't break free from that. And then uh, for me, the breakthrough was like I was saying, is as I began to realize, I see myself as outside. Jesus is there. Here's what I'm supposed to do, and I'm supposed to do this in a really good way and then offer it to him. And over a period of time, I began to realize that the truth of me, about me, was not that I was outside. Like I said last night, in that day, you're going to know I'm in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. But what, what we have is a pair of glasses that have been hammered out our prescription in this triangulation, and we read the Bible that way. You can find passages where the omnis are present. You can find passages where, where God is unapproachable in light on these things. And, and you know you have historical precedent for this in your life. There's things that have happened. And this all gets going and it creates that great, um, that great uh, pain within us. And it begins to make us, uh, some of us at least, to perfectionism. But what's the opposite of perfectionism? <laughs> Sloth. There's no way in the world I can do that, so I'm not even going to try. So in most perfectionist families, there's also the flip side, which is the sloth. It just can't be done. You know, you buy into perfectionism or you just let it go. Or as I was saying, you got, I am not special, but I can be. And then you got the whole denial thing. I, 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 what, I don't have a problem. I'm just fine. You know, Stephanie and John, they're not going to look at themselves. How many, how many years will it take before Stephanie will ever look at what's going on and what she's really doing in the relationship? Because she can't afford to. You can't afford to look at yourself until you know that Jesus has hold of you and the Father has you and they're not letting you go. And all this gobbledygook is what's keeping us from living life. But then you step on again and he says, well, you move to medication. I am not special and that is just too brutally painful for me to cope with, so I've got to stay busy. I'm going to talk on my cell phone all day long today. I'm not going to be silent. I'm going to stay so busy doing things that I don't have time to feel this going off inside of me. It's too painful. i got no answers. So I'll, I will, you know, classic medication, alcohol and drugs and stuff like that, but how about movies? How about busyness? How about being a consumer and a materialist? How about getting over here and staying so busy for God and for the church in this system that you don't have time to be present to yourself, let alone to your husband or your wife or your family? This is medication. We're just all drunk in one musical way or another, unable to be present, unable to feel, because it's too much to bear. And, but we can quote all kind of Bible. We may be driving around with a Bible verse on our car and caught up in all this and can't see it. And then there's one other way that all works out. I mean, these are scratching the surface. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of an overview for the moment. The other thing is that I'm not special, and it's your fault. <laughs> you got to make me feel special. So we go into this church system, and we do a deal. I will give myself to participate with you, but you have to take responsibility for me and make me special. And in these systems, you have pastors. I'm not special, but if you need me, I'm special. I need to be needed. 
So, and this thing then all becomes about each other, trying to make each other feel special, rather than about us hearing from Jesus and beginning to understand who we are in him and what's really happening. And it, then you can't let it go. And nobody can tamper with it. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about, do you? And then, then in that, thank God, from time to time, you have brave men and women who stand up and say, this is not working. And we're not doing this anymore. And nine-tenths of them leave. But one-tenth stays back and says, okay, let's figure out the way forward. And that seems to me to be where a lot of the worldwide church is in terms of the leadership of Joe and Mike and all those guys, John McKenna. They took a stance that this thing's not working. We know better. We, get, we got a feel for this. Let's go for it. And let's, let's walk it out and see how it works. And that's beautiful what's happening there. Now, when you come back over here um, to this I am not, the only solution there is to this is when you meet Jesus right here. Remember my friend in his panic attack? That's the solution, is that we begin to meet Jesus here. That's what happened to me when I was lost in New Orleans. This was my world, and I heard my father shout my name here in this. It wouldn't have done any good for him to stand by the car and shout my name. He had to come find me where I was in my darkness and in my lostness, and he did. And he spoke my name there. That's what I mean by Jesus I am. My friend encountered Jesus in his great anxiety. We encountered Jesus. I'm, I met Jesus in I, my journey of I'm not there yet. It's just lost in this anxiety and fear, trying to achieve something, trying to do something. And Jesus gently meets me and says, how did you get here to Scotland? Why? What is motivating you? Do you not see that as Abba Father already at work in you? And he's like, he says, you remember when you were sitting on those stairs when you were a little boy? <laughs> and your grandmama thought, bless his heart, he's just dumb. Could it be that I showed you something so beautiful your mind was blown and you were sitting there trying to figure out how to talk about it? Could it be that I gave you a share in my Abba Father when you were two years old? Could it be, John the Baptist, that even before you were born, I gave you a share in that and you jumped for joy in your mother's womb? And you begin to see how he takes us in our obsession, all of our brokenness, and he begins to weave that into something beautiful. And it's like, I'm like, okay, I'm getting this now. Because what we do, what I do, you may not be this way, seriously, but I am. I get a message from the Lord. This is what I see him doing. And then I want to go and do it. And I want to, I want to pull it together. And, then I stand, and I'm, the other day I was speaking with a friend who was talking to me about his, his son-in-law who was having some real serious problems, and he was really burdened about this. He said, we need to pray about this. We need to pray about this. We need to get God to heal this. You know, he was very earnest about it. I said, well, wait a minute. Back up. What if the reason that you feel this burden for your son-in-law is because the Father, Son, and Spirit feel this burden, and they want you to know they, they got it and that they're working on this? So they're going to share this burden with you so you will know what they're doing, not so you will go and do it, so you will know this is what they're doing. And you can relax and you can begin to participate in that journey rather than barreling in and say, we're going to get you healed. You say, no, Father, Son, and Spirit are working. What are they doing? Oh, somebody met a doctor the other day that was an expert on this. I, you begin to see what's going on. And for me, instead of trying to now craft this thing and make this thing happen, I begin to realize the reason Jesus has burdened me with this is because he's doing something about it all over the world. And he gave me a little part in it. I get to be one of the ones that stand up and explain this. But if he wasn't doing it already in all of y'all, at the same time, this wouldn't make any sense to anybody. Would it? I would have to walk in and figure out how I can begin to convince you of something. And then, then I've got to not only convince you of it, I've got to stand with you and be the cheerleader so you'll stay motivated to work it through. That's a lot of work and a lot of responsibility. And... and, and uh, lots of pastors do go down that route, and lots of us crash and burn. Thank God we get saved from ourselves and judged, and we begin to get free. Because Jesus is saying, this is what I'm doing, and you're part of it. Enjoy. I'm weaving this carpet. And one of the, one of the things, that, the ways that I think about that is, um, is if you think of a master carpet weaver, and he's here, and his five-year-old or 10-year-old son or daughter is on the other end weaving, 
and they're moving towards one another, but the five, -year, let's say it's an eight-year-old daughter, and she's just making one mistake after another, but she's having a good time. And the master weaver is so good that he incorporates her mistakes into a new pattern, always weaving it together, always weaving it together. And so when it comes out at the end, all of her mistakes and all of her failures have been rolled into this beautiful tapestry. And you see it. And, it, and, then, and then one day the master weaver shows his daughter, not only did I do that, but let me show you what I designed in eternity about you and your life. And you see it. And it's very real. It's very accepting of who we are and our brokenness and where we are in our struggle of I am not. And little by little, it's an incremental process that we're being healed. And our life is not, we're not waiting to get healed so God can use us. It's all of a piece. And he's doing it. And it really is beautiful. And if you get eyes to see it, it begins to change the way you see everybody around you. It helps you relax. It helps you calm down. It helps you accept yourself. It helps you accept other people. And you can begin to participate with them in the journey without shouldering a load and a responsibility that you can't bear. It brings you out of the attempt to save yourself. This, for me, I'm not there yet, but I can be. It can, the reason I put so much emphasis on what Jesus has done for us and the fact that it's finished. The reason seeing that little boy in the airport meant so much to me is I saw that I'm included in Jesus' thereness. I saw he's there, and I'm included in that. So what do you mean I'm not there yet? I'm there. I'm included. I can relax, and now I can begin to enjoy some of the things of my thereness. You see, that's why it's so important to put a point of emphasis on that aspect of theology, is that we're not talking about how do we get into Jesus. That's why, in my mind, it came to me one day, and it's a beautiful phrase that I just, the Spirit just gave to me. The gospel is not the news that you can receive Jesus into your life. The gospel is the news that Jesus has received you into his. So now let's figure out what this life that he's received us into is. And as we begin to see it that way, we begin to see that this is a lie. How can I say I'm not worthy when Jesus has embraced me? How can I say I'm not lovable or wanted or welcomed when he has in fact laid hold of me and taken me to be with his father? How can I say I'm not good enough? How can I say I'm not valuable? How can I say I'm not important, not worthy, not perfect, smart enough, beautiful enough, there yet, normal, sanctified, saved, reconciled, all the things that we want to put in. How can we say that's not true when Jesus has done what he's done not only with us but to us and for us? When he took us down and lifted us up, when he uh, lifted us into his relationship with his father, and he did that 2,000 years ago, that begins to reveal this to be a big fat lie, and now I can begin to look at it. Why are you laboring in the delusions of darkness? Now I can see it as darkness. Because now Jesus is saying, Baxter, I got you. I got you in the whole world, in me. And I'm sitting in my father's lap. That's what Stephen saw when Jesus was being, when he was being martyred. He looked up into heaven and saw the Son of Man standing at the right. He saw it. And he knew then, I, it's okay for me to die. I'm not going to die and disappear and go back into the abyss. I'm going there. And it's okay for him. And he gave him courage to let go and die in the arms both of the stones and the people that were hating him and murdering him and also in the arms of his other father, son, and spirit who had hold of him. It begins, to, it begins to reveal to us that this is not life. That here, instead of fear and shame and anxiety and worry, there should be, uh, the New Testament word is parecia. It means freedom, boldness, uh, unearthly assurance when you meet Jesus in your life little by little you begin to know it's okay it's okay to be where I am today it's okay to be in this process he's got me he's taken me it's okay and I can begin to have some hope about me in my future and today I can begin to believe that maybe this what Jesus is teaching me about the character of his father is really the truth and maybe I can begin to let go of this mythology that I've inherited. And maybe I can even begin to stand up and say, this is mythology. This is pagan. This is not Christian. This is not biblical. Stand up and say, no, 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 not in here. You can propagate that stuff on some radio if you want to, but you better be careful because that's not the truth. And you're hurting people. You begin to stand up and you begin to have brothers and sisters say, we got to, we got to speak out against this. This is killing people. This is just birthing the I am not and spinning this whole tornado around in people's souls and it's destroying <coughs> relationships and all kinds of stuff. I mean, I am not drives nations. 
I am not drives nations and gets them into wars with each other and will destroy each other because we have to be in control. We have to be dominant. We have to be the power. We, this is not just what's going on in you. It's what's going on in our states and in our communities. It's what's going on in all of our institutions. It's being fueled by this undercurrent of I am not in all these different ways that that works its way out in our lives. And it's madness. And we don't have to live that way. We don't have to live that way. We can begin to live in the freedom of Jesus I am and begin to see how he's using us in our lives, just like J.B. Phillips. Bless his heart, he spent his whole life trying to get there. Like my dog Nessie, scared to death. <laughs> the whole time, not only is he there, but he's involved in something that's beautiful and he's got a part to play in it. And he got to see it. He gets to see it now. He gets to rejoice in his life because he gets to see how his life was lived, not just as a independent person he gets to see how it was lived in Jesus even though he couldn't see it or couldn't see it very clearly like I can't see it and you probably can't see it in your life all right anybody got some comments on that one that's kind of a whirlwind tour there wasn't it pardon very eye open it does calm you doesn't it it bathes your soul with hopes what it's doing. I mean, that's part of it. And you, I mean, it was a major breakthrough for me in my life when I really saw how the Lord was fully aware of the fact that I was obsessive. And he was like, he said, man, we got this. Watch this. We can take this and watch what happens. And let's see how this works. And we're going to love Baxter and we're going to bring Baxter liberation and we're going to use him to leave breadcrumbs for lots of other people. And he's going to get to be part of their lives. And then you begin to see your own life that way and how he redeems your mistakes and your blunders and your disasters. And when you wake up on the other side, we're going to get to see how Jesus really redeemed our mistakes and our blunders. We made a mess and a, a trail of wreckage and destruction in many times. We're going to get to see how he said no to all that and brought that back to life on this side. That's what the resurrection's about. I could make a comment. So maybe the, the real question is, uh, when a pastor is uh, counseling a human being and, and he asks the question, do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior? Perhaps something you heard from Mr. Graham. I guess the real question is, do you accept that Jesus has accepted you into his life? Uh -huh. That's the real question. Accepting your acceptance. Yeah. And our answer is, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Yeah. That's our answer. I mean, has anybody in this room ever moved beyond that? Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I mean, for real. Are we, I, I've asked that question before, and I had a guy raise his hand and said, I have. And I'm like, oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, he actually thought he had in, uh, uh, for now. But that's the question. The real question is, what are you going to do with the fact that Jesus has included you in his world? Don't you want to know more about his world? Mm -hmm. If he's included us in his life, well, what is his life like? That's when we begin to explore and look into the way he, he and his father love each other and, and the place and role and beauty of the Holy Spirit and the way Jesus is included. Jesus, here's, here it is. Jesus has included us in his own relationship, his own personal relationship with his father. He has included us in his own anointing in the Holy Spirit. He has included us in his own relationship with every person on the planet. And he has included us in his relationship with the earth and everything in the entire cosmos. And he says, now live in it. Go and live accordingly. Live in my relationship with my Father. Live in my anointing in the Holy Spirit. Live in my relationship with other people. And live in my relationship with the whole creation. That's what we've been given. And we're like, Lord, I don't even know where to step. I don't even know how to start. And he says, well, I'll walk it with you. I'll teach you. First thing we've got to do is we've got to get rid of this doctrine of God that's come in and get that out of the way so you can begin to rejoice in my Father. And then you can begin to, then you can begin to believe that I actually have included you in my anointing in the Holy Spirit. And then you'll be saying, why are we stopping with a second blessing? Why we should be saying, as my friend Kim Bluth says, thank you, Holy Spirit, I'll have more, please. And if I've been included in Jesus' anointing in the Holy Spirit, there ought to be a whole lot more great things going on in our lives, shouldn't it? Why don't we ask for it? See, we begin to have faith and we begin to pray with some expectation, not because of us, but because of what Jesus has done and who we are in him. 
And then we begin to think, well, how in what way am I concluded in Jesus' relationship with all creation? Now we can begin to understand why people care about the whales and the animals and the environment. And now we begin to have a way of understanding how to work that out without going over into some extremes such that, such that people, don't begin, people around us don't begin to trust us at all about what we're talking about with the environment. We're saying, Jesus, this is your environment. What are you doing about this? How do we fit into what you're doing? We don't want to, I don't want to uh, see it the way I see it. I want to see it the way you see it. What's real here, Jesus? Because over here you got this group saying that we're all going to hell in the handbasket today. Over here you got this group saying everything's going to be fine. This, you know, global warming. Who knows what to believe about this? Jesus knows what to believe about it. Let's ask him. Let's come together and say, Jesus, you teach us how to be in the midst of your world. Because we're botching it up again. And we don't want to do it, but we don't know any better. So teach us. You don't think Jesus is going to begin to give us some more insights on this and cut through the, the crap and the prejudice and the politics and the greed like he does in the church and like he does everywhere else? He's going to cut right through that so we can see. So he's given us a place in his creation. That's the kingdom of heaven. We are included in his relationship with everything in the entire cosmos. That's a big Jesus. But that's what he's done. No longer do I call you slaves because the slave doesn't know what the master is doing. I've called you friends and brothers because all things that the Father has shown me, I'm showing you. All right, other comments? We've got a few more minutes. I think everybody's thinking I'd like to know this about 40 years ago. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> no, it, it's, it is a process, and sometimes I like to just to make the comment that let's just suppose for a minute that uh, that history as we know it will last another 50,000 years. Um, that would put us right now today in 2011 in the early church. It kind of puts some perspective on the process and the journey because the Holy Spirit is not simply interested in individuals. The Holy Spirit is. But the Holy Spirit's passion is to bring everybody up to speed. We comprehend what is the height and depth and love of God uh, together with the saints. This is, a, this is a process that involves our history not just my personal history, but the history of the human race, where we are globally. It involves all kinds of, it's very three-dimensional in, uh, in that way. So the Holy Spirit's working because the Holy Spirit's not going to rest until we're all up to speed and we all see it. So it's about the education of the human race. Um, and not just information, mind you, but digging around as Paul Young has us, you know, sought of you in the, in the garden of our souls. So we will see it. We will see it, and we will be embarrassed, and we will be believers, and it is a process that takes millennia, but right now, we're, we see what we see, and we say, thank you, Holy Spirit, we'll have more, please. We'll have more, please. Well, it is embarrassing because, because me and myself, I, I just feel like I've been so deceived, you know, until... You know, I realized what their teachings, you know, about being in the Father, you know, him as, you know, and then I was an associate pastor of a big church, you know, and I and I always just bounced over that, you know, and I, I never really realized until now, and it's like, wow, I just felt so violated in a sense, you know, and so wounded in a sense also by by the church. But, and I'm just thrilled that, you know, that the Holy Spirit is just really giving me the eyes to see now, you know, and it's beautiful, and I just can't imagine living that other way now, I just can't. Thank you, Holy Spirit, we'll have more, please. Yeah, and, and, we want, and we want to be to the place to where, uh, bring us to the place to where those who have wounded us we can have some compassion on them and forgive them and have compassion and pray that, that uh, they would come to see too 
because they, they have their history. Pardon? Yeah, and that is the compassion of Jesus, yeah. and that's where it comes. That's why there's hope for us in our brokenness and in our relationships, um, is that there's something deeper at work here than just simply us and our wounds. And we can say, okay, I can let go of some things here, and we can trust and we can grow, and that's what happens. Um, and and that's what Jesus is doing is knitting all this together. And, uh, on, and you remember the movie? I mean, you saw the movie Lord of the Rings. Remember the movie? And they were down in the cave system, and Gandalf was leading them through, and they go across this little, it looked like a string of stone, you know, across this huge abyss. And the fire's coming up like this, and they get across, and Gandalf turns, and he takes that staff, and he just, you shall not pass, and boom, like that. And it's lapping up and all, and it finally just kind of goes down. And I was watching, and I thought, man, that's the cross. That's, that's the Father. That's the death of the Son. That's the Father, Son, and Spirit slamming down, saying, here you have freedom to live in your own darkness and confusion, and you have freedom to hurt people and freedom to harm the earth, and you have freedom because you have to be free to learn and grow and to become. But none of that passes over this side. Here, the, the years that the locusts have eaten are restored. Here, your blunders are, are redeemed. And here... The murderers are not only forgiven, but the the people who child was murdered get their child back, and the murderer becomes reconciled. This is just beautiful how he's going to restore all things in that, and how long it will take, I don't know. But man, that's the, we've got freedom on this side, but that does not transfer to the other side. There's redemption, and our disasters and our mistakes will be redeemed. And we will be embarrassed in a good family way. I'm not not shamed. Not ashamed. We, it will be it will be a healing thing. I'm kind of curious. Um, we've talked about a lot of things today, and there seems to be. Are you seeing? Are you, you've spoken to a lot of different early churches. Do you see sort of a return back to what the early church was seeing uh, as far as um, the true gospel is? I mean, I know we kind of got off track, got away from it, but do you see? Church, the body of Christ, see, the whole returning to what it was like before. Do I see the body of Christ returning as a whole to what it was like early on to be part of the main conversation? Yeah. Um, not really. But I do see people. I, I see what I call the flat bellies. That's the the 35 and below that hadn't they hadn't achieved tired them yet. You know. The, uh, <laughs> I call them the flat bellies. They're doing a fantastic job um, at functioning intuitively in in the truth. And they're writing books that are really beautiful. Like Rob Bell's book, Love Wins, um, is a beautifully beautifully written book. He he knows God is love, and he wants us to know it. He's done a good job with it, and I see that. But that message was sounded in, in, in 19th century liberalism, too. And so for this to work, it's got to be rooted in that recovery of that much deeper ancient vision of the Father, Son, and Spirit. It's got to be rooted in the character of God uh, as Father, Son, and Spirit. But that love is other-centered, and that's who they really are. And so I want to come alongside something like that and give a theological vision that goes with that. Now, whether or not that takes the church back, don't know. But it's certainly taken a bunch of people in conversation forward. And uh, I see a lot of people that are, strang- that are straddling the, the back door of the church, keeping a head in to listen if anything's going on, but really they've already moved on, and they're in the parking lot. They hadn't thrown Jesus out with the church's bathwater, and they're not, they're not eager to walk away from, quote, the church. But at the same time, they've smelled something beautiful. They've got a hint of a flower yet unknown, and they're trying to go for it. I see that. Um, and I also see some some things happening. For example, I mean, Pope Benedict is an amazing man. Um, he, he has a lot of fantastic things to say. I get in trouble with my Protestant evangelicals for even reading the Pope, but I mean, I've been that, his encyclical letter, Space Salvi, S P E S A L V I. Just Google it and read down, read page uh, paragraph 47. It's astounding. So there's a lot of good going. I don't know. 
you know, I, I just see that there's a worldwide movement right now in which there's a lot of interest in recovering the, the Trinitarian vision. Now, whether or not that includes the church, how that overlaps with the church, I don't know. But I know that institutions, by definition, are, are have a lot of inertia and they resist change. Uh, but there have been periods in history when I mean, you look at Josiah's reign in Israel. Look at what happened in the Reformation. Look at what happened in the New Testament, the New Testament time. Look at what happened in the Reformation. I mean, um, that's where we are. We're we're at a place in history where this this vision of God has come crashing into this vision, and we're having to make decisions which way we're going to go. And I, I have no clue how it's going to turn out, except except to say, when a book like The Shack sells 20 million copies worldwide, which means 20 million, more than 20 million people read that, because most of us, when you read it, you gave it to a friend to read. And I've heard story after story where it got passed around in the in the office complex. There were 10 people in represented. So, I mean, I don't know how many millions are represented in that 20 million, but that's a huge number of people that are reading a story which is about this God and this love, this Trinitarian fellowship. So that conversation is going on worldwide. I, I don't know what form it will take, except um, I know it's way bigger than anything I can imagine. So we'll see what happens with the institution at that point. No one has been left behind in Jesus. Now, where they are in their journey of understanding that is another matter. Where I am, where you are. Sometimes people say, watch that movie. I know it's just fiction. Which movie are you talking about? I didn't watch it, and I didn't read it, and I won't. But it would be it would be kind of ironic, though, if all the people that that are working that whole left behind scene suddenly had a dream where they were the ones left behind. I mean, that would be like the Holy Spirit to give them a good fright like that, just to say, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Now in the church, I've got this play going around called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Slave. And it's wicked. I mean, it's really wicked about those people who are that kind. But now they're doing skits in these churches with that. Fear-based. Fear-based in the scripture is crystal clear that judgment begins with the household of God. I just read that this morning in Peter. I'm like, judgment begins with the household of God. Now, judgment, again, is that discerning into, but if you're going to play that card in fear-based, then you've got to realize you're standing in front of a mirror, and it'll come back uh, 